talk about the tabernacle, all right? Uh, the reason I want to deal with the tabernacle is, you know, the, there's a lot of folks that might think, you know, the, the dealing with the tabernacle and understanding the tabernacle is going to be really dry, really boring, have nothing to do with me. But in reality, the tabernacle is a very clear picture of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ right in our midst. And what we want to do is we want to look at the tabernacle in just that light. Now, tonight we're going to do pretty much just nothing more than just an introduction. We may not even finish it. But next is 25, 8. We want to build around this. And he says this, and let them make me a sanctuary. This is what he tells, this is what God tells Moses. And he says, listen to this, because this is key, that I may dwell among them. That's the key to the tabernacle, that God might dwell among his people. And now when we look at this, he initiated, it was God who initiated the building of the tabernacle. Moses didn't just come up and say, hey, listen, I think it'd be a good idea to have a place for God to stay. That's not the way it went down. God gave him instructions as to how to build this. And he did so with a primary purpose in mind. And that primary purpose is answered in that verse. And that is that he might dwell among his people wants to be in our midst. By the way, God has always been just that way. Uh, because we see when God created man, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, he created the world. And, and, and I've often wondered this, because we talk about mankind being placed, Adam being placed in this special garden of all the world that God created. And there was none of this world that was bad by any stretch of the imagination. Sin had not come yet. Sin had not been a part of any of this. So, so everything in the world was absolutely and totally perfect. But God chose to build a garden, just a specific place for man to dwell. Why did he do that? He did so because in this garden was a specific place where Adam could live and dwell with God where God could come into his midst, have fellowship with him, talk with him. This is before sin. So it was a place of fellowship and it was this designated place in all the world. It was like the designated place where God could have fellowship with his creation, with man. And so when we look at this, God's always wanted that. Um, the interesting thing is, is when man sins, what's the, what happens? He gets kicked out of the garden, right? Because the fellowship that he had with God from that moment on is hindered. And so what we find is that God gives us periods of, of time and places where we find his fellowship. All right? The tabernacle is one of those places. And every time we see this place where there is fellowship, what we find is, is, is this fellowship that, that God ultimately restores through the person of Jesus Christ. And it is in the person of Jesus Christ that this fellowship is established. I'm just going to throw this at you. Uh, based upon New Testament scripture, I don't want to give you something that I'm just assuming because I don't think this is an assumption at all. I don't think I'm speculating. But we are told that all things were created by who? Christ. Christ. For who? So who was in all likelihood the one that was in the garden having fellowship with Adam? Christ. So when we look at this picture, every time we see this picture where God wants to dwell with man, be with man, it is, a, it is in the image or is in the picture or symbolically even at times a shadow of those things um, of Jesus Christ walking and dwelling and being with man. So the tabernacle, like I said, is no exception. It is a place where sinful man and holy God could mutually meet and come together for fellowship. I mean, think about it. Sinful man in a sinful world, where's God going to fellowship? He creates a place, a tabernacle that would be holy, and there'll be a place within that that is the holiest of holies, and is a place where God can dwell, where man and God can meet basically as a result of the sacrifices that are made or whatever the things that take place, but it's a place where God and man can come together. So that's the tabernacle. So if it's a place for God and man to come together, the God that we're looking at coming together with, as per we see in other places in scripture, is the person of Jesus Christ. So the God of the tabernacle 
is the person of Jesus Christ. All right, so God reveals himself in just that way. So the tabernacle, the furniture, everything that's associated with it uh, serves as object lessons to Israel, but more so object lessons in regard to Jesus Christ. All right, now a lot of people think and say, well, <coughs> Jesus is not necessarily preached in the Old Testament. I beg to differ. In fact, I see him preached all the way through the Old Testament. And uh, he may not be preached by his name Jesus, but he is preached all the way through the Old Testament. Now, when we look at this, what we find is they are, when we're talking about these objects, when we're talking about the furniture, when we're talking about the tabernacle itself, whatever it is we're dealing with, they are for lack of a better word, replicas. The Bible calls them shadows. They are shadows of those things that exist in heaven. Um, now, in fact, Moses was given instructions as to how to make these things in such a way as to show the true pattern that God desires for us to see. Uh, he tells us in, in Hebrews, in fact, over in the New Testament, uh, the book of Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 especially, <coughs> gives us this picture uh, of what all that these things in the Old Testament represented so that we could see that Jesus Christ is what all of these things represented. Okay? He is uh, the actual of the shadow that we see in those things in the Old. He tells us in Hebrews 8, 5, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. He said, all these things that I would have you to do to make this tabernacle, to put this tabernacle together, the objects that are in the tabernacle, the furniture, uh, all the ceremonies that are to be represented, all of these things are a pattern of Jesus Christ. It's a pattern of what we have in heaven. All right. Now, when you say a pattern or a shadow, and there's a, we'll talk about that in a moment, there are different images that are given uh, to us. We understand and know that here's what a shadow does. And again, we'll talk about this more in a second. But a shadow, if I were to take my hand, I don't know if I can catch a shadow anywhere. There it is right there. If I were to take a shadow, that light's casting a shadow on my hand. Now the hand, the shadow, is, is a replica of my hand. But the shadow can only give a form of the hand. The details of the hand are not found in the shadow. We need to be very careful because sometimes we get really carried away with the things that we find, for example, in the tabernacle. And all he wants us to see is the image or the picture that it portrays. Sometimes the details are not displayed. All right. And again, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, in a way, the, the tabernacle is the Bible of the Old Testament for a time. And I say, it because, I say that because at this point, keep in mind, they, they don't have the written word. What they have, basically the only thing they have at this point in time is the law that Moses brought down from the mountain. All right. And so they have that. Um, but it's not like they each have their own copy and it's written down in their hand. The scribes haven't done anything with it so much at this time. But it's available. They know the law. But that's, that's all they have. And so the tabernacle becomes the thing that they look to and see the pictures and the images and the shadows, if you would, of what God wants them to know and wants them to see. And so what they can see in the tabernacle and all these object lessons are such things as the holiness of God. Uh, they can see sin and its judgments as we take a look at some of the things. Um, they'll see that. They can see the reconciliation with God and how that must come about. The priest comes in, offers up sacrifices and the holy of holies so the sins might be forgiven. Um, so they're able to see in the tabernacle all the things that God wants them to see that brings them to this place where they can have faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him as their Lord and Savior. All right. And so what we find is while the law does not teach them about how to be saved, we do see a lot of the lessons about how to be saved in the temple or in the tabernacle. By the way, tabernacle, temple, all right, tabernacle, 
comes before the temple. It was when they were roaming in the wilderness, and so it had to be mobile. All right, they could pick it up and take it elsewhere, then reset it back up. Um, and the temple was not, the temple was stationary. But by and large, everything we see about the tabernacle is the same as what we see about the temple. Everything about the temple is pretty much the same as the tabernacle. Just one is stationary and one is mobile. But they both have the same picture. They are both the same shadow, the same uh, sign. All right, same things we need to be able to see. All right, and so what we find is, is the, uh, um, this tabernacle is designed to give them the pictures of their salvation that they need so greatly. And, and we overcomplicate this, by the way. It's a really simple thing to, to observe and to understand that, listen, the tabernacle is there so that man who is sinful can have fellowship with God who is holy. He wants to dwell among us. All right, so that's the picture. Now, a couple of quick points before we really kind of move on in some of this. Um, this study is not for the purpose of explaining every detail of the tabernacle. Um, it, it's a tough one. It, I mean, that would, we would be a long time really detailing all those things out. And quite frankly, there are a lot of things about those things of the tabernacle that God really doesn't even give us an explanation for. Um, a lot of people try to speculate on some of these things, but it, that's all it is, is speculation. But what we want to do is we want to show that it serves as a teaching tool to, re, to reveal Jesus Christ actually to Israel and even to us today as we look back and see some of the things that it represented helps us to know that, listen, God was the same God then as he is now. All right. And he revealed himself in those ways then as well. All right. And so what happens is, is in the day of its presence, these things were Many of the things that you see in that were probably mysteries to Israel, but the tabernacle was not intended to be so much a mystery, but more of a revelation of the mysteries, kind of to open that door, to kind of reveal some of the things, if they would just look closely enough to see it, to reveal some of those mysteries, some of those things they needed to understand and needed to comprehend. By the way, when we talk about mysteries of the Old Testament, more than not, we're typically talking about how we see some of the pictures of the church in the Old Testament, or we see pictures of the Gentiles and, and how we have an opportunity to come to know Christ. And those are the kind of mysteries that we see. But keep in mind, God never intended for his salvation to be a mystery to the people. He wanted to make sure that that was evident. The tabernacle was a great, great opportunity to show the people um, that this was not mysterious, but it was actually a very simple matter of God wanting and desiring to dwell with them and that God is a holy God and that they can't approach a holy God without something taking place that would cause their sins to be forgiven so that they could stand in the presence of a holy God. And so even the tabernacle revealed those things, just like as we talk about Jesus Christ dying for our sins, paying the penalty for our sin, they could talk about how that tabernacle represented the fact that God would make a provision to do just that. Now that provision is Jesus Christ, and they may have a difficult time grasping that, but that is the provision. But they had to understand and they knew that they needed to have faith in God and trust that he was providing for them and that they would follow his plan and trust him in this. All right. The second thing is have no doubt that the Old Testament did preach Jesus. Maybe not by name, but preached Jesus. Uh, salvation in the Old Testament was salvation just like we have salvation today. It was by grace, uh, by uh, grace through faith, all right? Uh, it was by God's grace, and then we accepted that, trusted that by faith, all right? And um, so what we understand is this whole picture is having that faith to trust and to know Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that Abraham was saved by faith, and he was pre-law. He was before this time. So if Abraham was saved by faith, if we are saved by faith, then 
it, it only stands to reason that everybody in between would be saved by faith. And so what we find is during the time of Israel and during the time of the law, the tabernacle stood as, as, um, as a symbol, if you would, or as a shadow of the things of God so they might recognize and know, listen, I need to believe and trust that this is a shadow of the things of God and the things in heaven and that all that is presented by this tabernacle is to bring us into a relationship with God. I need to trust that. I need to, by faith, uh, rely upon that and know that. Uh, kind of interesting because when you get farther over and you see where God made a big issue out of rebuilding the temple and that kind of thing, and there was still people that stayed in Babylon. There was people that even before that time, there was a divided kingdom. After Solomon, the kingdom divided. Jeroboam took the north. Uh, Rehoboam took the south. And basically, Jeroboam didn't want the people to come back to the temple and worship. And so he established places of worship apart from that. Uh, and you get over in the New Testament, uh, the woman at the well, I think it was Cody just preached on that, the woman at the well, and uh, at the well, she said, you know, I've been told that, you know, we're to worship up here in these mountains. You say that we ought to worship at the temple. I, what do we do? All right. God provided the temple. He didn't provide the mountains in Samaria. He wanted, there's, a, there's one specific plan. In this picture of the tabernacle, it was so they might understand, listen, there's one place where God dwells with man. And it was at the tabernacle. All right. Today, there's but one place where we can have fellowship with God, and that is through the man Jesus Christ. Amen. It is, he is the one way, truth, and the life. And so it's a picture of that. It's so that we might understand. Listen, God provides the plan. We don't provide a substitute. God provides the plan. The day of Israel, he provided the tabernacle to illustrate that. And they might see that and know that. And know that this is the place where holy God dwells on earth. And we have to come here to serve him. And so it was an important part of understanding that. Um, John 5, 46, he says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Now, let me clarify. Jesus is telling uh, the Pharisees and those that were around him, he was telling them, that, listen, why, you, you're not going to believe me. You don't even believe what Moses had to say. Well, what did Moses have to say? All right. We have to go back to the law. We have to go back to the instructions of the tabernacle. Um, Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So we have to go back and say, okay, somewhere in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Jesus was preached. Otherwise, Jesus is a liar over here in the New Testament. Well, we know that's not true. All right. So if he says, Moses spoke of me, well then... There has to be something that Moses had to say in those five books because that's what Moses wrote. And so when we look back at this picture, what we find is, listen, Jesus was preached in the Old Testament. Jesus said he was preached in the Old Testament. And he says he was preached by Moses. He was spoken of by Moses. So when we look at this tabernacle, we realize that's just one of the things that God has given Israel by the hand of Moses given Israel that speaks and teaches and preaches Jesus is the only means and the only way to salvation. All right. So that's what we see in this. So we know that that's the case. I, I just want to make sure I'm trying to cover my bases because I don't want you to walk away from here and say, Barry's just speculating or, or just guessing or, you know, um, just assuming these things. That's not so. The Bible tells us Moses preached about Jesus Christ. Jesus said Moses did. So I got to find where Moses preached about Jesus Christ. I see it clearly in the tabernacle. All right. So that's why this is important. And that's why I think studying the tabernacle is important. The basic differences between the tabernacle and the temple was only, uh, it was merely just the fact that, that, that one was built by tents and the other intending to be mobile. And the other was a temple that was a permanent structure. And so don't let anybody kind of try to get stupid on you and, and, and kind of get carried away with all that. They both represent God among us which would be in the person of Jesus Christ because it is in the person of Jesus Christ that we have that fellowship with God. So it has to represent Jesus Christ in that picture. So the God that comes upon this and comes down, you know, and you see all the smoke that's, that, that fills the temple and, you, and, uh, and all the salutations of trumpets and blowing and all of that to, to welcome him into the temple and all those things that take place is to welcome Jesus Christ. All right. And we need to make sure we get a, 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 a visual of that. 
All right. Let me also say to be careful, there's a couple of things I want to make mention of here. Three, actually. Some mistakes that I think some people will make when they study the tabernacle. I've already kind of hinted to some of these, but I want to make them a little clearer. Do not, do not try to make every detail in the tabernacle mean something. It doesn't have to. In fact, every detail in the tabernacle might very well mean something, but God doesn't give us all the details. Which means even if they do mean something, God has not told us what they mean. So for us to speculate or to guess in regard to what they mean uh, would be the sin of presumption. All right. We would presume to know something that only God knows. And so we want to be very careful not to do that. Let me give you an example. One writer, <laughs> I found this one kind of comical because, you know, you search through some of these. But one writer claimed that the nail that is used to fasten the tent to the ground is not to be driven in all the way to the ground, but to leave some of it exposed. And they said, the reason for that is because it represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That that exposed is his resurrection, that that's buried is his death. And I'm like, okay, show me that in scripture. I really want to see where the Bible says that, you know. We can't just assume that, boy, this looks like it might make a good illustration or it might make a good picture. And so we just preach it as though it's absolute truth. We can't do that. I heard a preacher one time preach at one of our pastor's conferences back when we were in our Southern Baptist days. And he preached that Jesus on the cross of Calvary, when, he, when uh, both water and blood flowed forth, he said the blood was the life of man and the water was the life of God. And I'm like, what? 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 It's just blood and water. It's blood and water. All right? Why does it have to be something? And when God doesn't even say that's what it is, you have to speculate. You have to assume things that aren't given you uh, to assume. I mean, there, there's no information to give you that. And that's what people will do sometimes. Be careful. Any of your studies, by the way, I don't care if it's end time prophecy or like this, the tabernacle, be really careful not to assume those things. And one of the reasons is this, because when you speculate like that, uh, when we make what, we would, what I would call absurd assertions, um, then what happens is our credibility then is challenged. And when we do speak the truth, people aren't going to want to believe us because we're so ridiculous in some of the assumptions that we make. Um, so just keep that in mind, because it's possible that every detail does have some hidden meaning. But unless God reveals it to us, I don't know what it is. All right. The writer of Hebrews, which I believe is likely Paul, but regardless, the writer of Hebrews uh, agrees with this statement, by the way. He mentions the cherubim, for example, over the mercy seat and basically says this, that he is unable to clearly know the particulars of, of God's meaning. That's what he says. I'll read it for you. In Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 5, uh, this is what the writer says. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat. Now look at what he says. Of which we cannot now speak particularly. See, I don't, I can't really speak to it because I don't know that I really get it all. He said, I don't know the details of all that. In heaven, one day I'll be able to, one day I'll get it. One day I'll go, oh, well, how did I not see that? But he says, for now, I, I can't really speak to it particularly. I don't know the details, all right? Don't know why, don't know, you know, the, the particulars as to why God chose to do these things in just the fashion that he did, but he did, all right? So that's what we have. So one might, you know, um, offer some possible meaning, but be clear. This is my opinion. There's nowhere in Scripture that says this. And, and, and even then, be careful when you offer an opinion, at least have a little bit of basis. Don't just come up with something off the wall that you just decided could very well be true. So it must be. Uh, when I was a young teen, I saved up enough money and I bought myself a little used motorcycle. It was only a Honda 90. It's just a little thing, you know, because I was, I was only like 13, 14 years old, maybe even younger than that. And so I saved up money and I bought this used Honda 90. And I brought it to the house, you know, and, and my dad said, okay, before you ride this, I want to make sure you know how to take care of it. And so he, 
he went over every detail that I needed to know, showed me how to check the oil, showed me, you know, if the chain were to pop off, how to put it back on, how to fix a flat tire. I mean, he went through a whole gamut of things and he said, I want to make sure that you know what to do. So if something happens, you can fix it. All right. And so he went through all of these different things and, and revealed them to me and showed me how to do all of those things. Well, when he got done, I said, now, Dad, is that is that everything? Is there anything else I need to know? He said, I have showed you everything you need to know today. And now, stop and think about that. Is there plenty more God could give us? Absolutely. Plenty more details? Absolutely. John said that, you know, he couldn't even possibly write everything that Jesus said. So there's plenty more. But God gave us every single thing we need to know. And so don't get caught up on the things that you don't see. And don't get caught up on those things that God doesn't give us the detail with because God has chosen not to do so. All right. Now, a second thing we want to be careful of is do not make things that are similar to one another symbolic of one another. Now, I say that because you don't want to let your imagination run wild. For example, some people have said the silver hooks that hold up the curtains around the tabernacle. They say, well, that represents the church holding up the truth. OK, I get that. I guess I get that it's the church's responsibility. We do have the responsibility uh, to keep truth. I mean, it's our, we're the ones that that propagate such things. We're the ones that share it with the world. But it's got nothing to do with the hooks holding up the curtain. All right. To my knowledge, at least. So, you know, God doesn't say that. And so if we're not careful, we'll take something that seems very similar and say, okay, this is what it means. This is, they're similar, so they must be the same. Well, that's not true. In the New Testament, we get a picture of that too. We, are, we as believers are told to be what? Salt and light. Are we not? Are we not told to be salt and light to the world? But that doesn't mean salt and light are one and the same. I'm told to be like salt, and I'm also told to be like light. All right? So both of them apply to me, and both of them have applications to what I need to be. However, that doesn't mean salt and light are one and the same. That would be a different picture altogether. All right? So they both give a different illustration, even though they're mentioned together. So don't assume that salt and light are one and the same and mean the same thing and just, you know, are to be treated equal. They're not. Because they're used in the same sentence, because they're used in the fashion that they are, uh, don't assume that they are not separate. They are separate. And they do not represent each other. They represent each a truth for my life. Do not try to make the, the, the tabernacle represent believers and the church. Now here's one of the biggest flaws that I see with people quite often is they try to make that tabernacle a picture or a type of the church. It's a type of Christ, period. All right. We're not trying to make the church dwell with men. All right. And he tells us the purpose in the tabernacle. And because he tells us the purpose in the tabernacle, it rules out the church altogether. All right. So he tells us that he wants to dwell with men. By the way, in our day and age, he uses us much the same way. He even calls us a temple. And, but he does that because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. And he uses us in this day and age to um, to allow God to dwell with men. All right. He does so in each of our lives. But that's not the tabernacle that we see in the Old Testament. So don't liken the two together just because they, the, they seem similar. All right. And so what we find is that they're not one and the same. Let me give you an illustration in all of that. He talks about the, the lampstand in the tabernacle. The lampstand in the tabernacle is a picture of the light of Christ. We'll talk about that when we get to it. But it's how Christ is the light to the world. All right. Picture of Jesus. In Revelation, he tells us that the lampstand in Revelation um, is, he tells us that each of those is the seven churches of Asia. Does he not? Okay. So a lot of people say, well, see, that means the lampstand in the tabernacle is actually representing the church. Well, no, it doesn't mean that. It means in Revelation, the lampstand represents the seven churches of Asia, but it doesn't mean the one in the tabernacle does. Both of them, both of them actually mean that Jesus is a light to the world. In, Reve in, in, in Revelation, he is a light 
through the church. And in the temple or the tabernacle, he is the light to Israel and to those that Israel is to reach. All right. So it's important that we understand that they're just because they could, you know, just because it sounds like they should be able to interchange. They don't. There's still a picture of Jesus Christ, and he is the light in both cases, but they're both represented in a different fashion. Can you imagine if you're the priest in the, in the tabernacle, and this little boy is trying to understand the, the, the things that take place in the tabernacle, and, you, and he says, well, what's that, light, what's that lampstand represent? Well, that represents the seven churches of Asia. What? What? What's a church? Where's Asia? <laughs> what's... You, it's, it's, it's not practical. It doesn't even make sense that it would represent those things because it would make no sense to the people of Israel in that setting. That setting is to let them see that God, the purpose, remember the purpose, that God wants and desires to dwell with them. So everything about that tabernacle has to, has to revolve around God desiring to dwell with them. All right, nothing to do with anything else but to dwell with them. That's the purpose. He already stated that. So everything has to wrap around that. All right. So uh, that's the picture of the things that we want to be careful not to get caught up in. Um, we can only see as far as God gives us light to see in all of this regardless. Um, and so we're given greater light today than they were given in their day. We have the privilege of being able to look back. We have the privilege of having all 66 books of the Bible. We have the privilege of uh, being able to study what God has already done through Israel and prior to that and all through that. We, we have a greater light today. Things, you know, we have the Holy Spirit of God living and dwelling within us. We have what they did not have. And so we have a greater light, but they could only see what light God gave them. Well, the light that God gave them was the tabernacle. God dwelt in the tabernacle, not in their lives. Today, God dwells in our lives. And so the light that they had in order to see the plan of God was in the tabernacle. And they were able to see it through the tabernacle. All right. Um, and, and, and we'll do far better, by the way, to allow the scriptures to give us our spiritual interpretation or the meanings of the tabernacle. And that's what we're going to try to do. All right. Um, notice the significance of the tabernacle in Hebrews chapter eight. I want to read a couple of things. Chapter eight and verse five. He says, who serve unto the I want you to listen to all of this example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So we notice three words, example, shadow, pattern. That's the tabernacle. He makes it very clear. Listen, this is designed to give you a shadow of what's to come. This is designed to give you a shadow of what God desires, desires and, and where God wants to be. All right. And then he says in Hebrews 9, 9, he gives us another word, which is basically the same, which was a figure for the time then present. All right. So we see all these different words that basically are, you know, a pattern or a copy of the things that are actually um, in heaven. And so when we look at the layout, the structure, the furniture, the ceremonies, they all work together in perfect harmony so that, you know, so that you see the key to understanding this uh, is to grasp that whole that whole concept of, of, of harmony, if you would, all these things working together to give us one picture of what God does and how he is able to dwell among men. All right. So the, the central theme is that of how wicked, sinful man, uh, sinful man is and um, how we might enter into the very presence of a just and a holy God and have fellowship with him. That's a central theme. Um, one last thing, and I'll go ahead and close. And we'll pick up the rest of this later. Keep in mind that the Holy of Holies was very exclusive. Nobody just walked into the Holy of Holies. You know, once a year, the high priest. Uh, nobody just walked in. And you notice that the, the, the temple was just two rooms. Um, then there was a wall around it. And there was the outer court. And then beyond that was all the world, everything else. Sinful man lived in all the world. All right. We didn't sinful man didn't come into the temple without a sacrifice. 
Right? There had to be a sacrifice. And, and sinful man never ever entered into that holy of holies. That was where God's dwelling place was, if you would. So the whole picture is understanding and knowing that, listen, God is so holy that he has to make a provision for us to be able to have fellowship with him. Nothing we can do. Everything has to be done through him. Well, who was it through? Jesus Christ. Again, picture of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why when we see in Mark 15, 38, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. When Jesus Christ died and uh, resurrected, the veil that separate the Holy of Holies from everything else, the veil that separated it was rent from top uh, to bottom and it was just torn in two. What was that saying? The path had been opened. Jesus had opened it. Jesus had made it possible then for man to be able to come and sit in God's lap and cry, Abba, Father. You know, he made it possible for us. So that's, that's where we're at. And it was through the person of Jesus Christ. The temple, the tabernacle represents that very thing. All right. Um, I've got six more things that we'll deal with in the introduction. Then we'll get into some things. All right. Any quick questions about what we talked about tonight? You think this is going to be all right? You think you're going to enjoy this all right? How many of you have really studied the tabernacle before? I mean, in detail, good job, good, good. You know, um, I'll be real honest, I've studied it, but I I'm hoping to really take a little deeper study in this, make sure that we really, I want you to see Jesus Christ in all of this. And that's the picture. All right, let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for the evening. Thank you for the time of Bible study and fellowship. And Lord God, I just pray that you'll bless in our lives. Watch over us, care for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.